Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Brand Design Masters podcast. I'm your host, Philip Van Dusen, and I am super, super excited. I always say I'm super excited, but I'm extra excited to be here with Rachel Zarell today. Rachel founded the Seven Layer Studio in 2004, and it's grown into an award-winning agency specializing in brand identity systems, and they work with small to medium-sized clients in a wide range of industries. She's got over two decades of experience, and she finds her passion helping brands hatch an idea and bring it to life through comprehensive design thinking and her memorable aesthetic. Rachel's received an executive management certificate from Yale University and has a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Syracuse University. And she lives here in New Jersey with her husband and her, yes, count them, four children. And with that, I welcome Rachel. Great to be here, Philip. I'm excited to chat with you. So I have to tell everybody a little bit about how we met because um, we go way back and we actually live in towns right next to each other. And uh, when I was just started my agency on my own, I just left my last full-time gig, and I had been working in my home office for about a year, and I started to go kind of rammy, and I thought, I got to go to a code working space or to the library or whatever. I have to get out of this house. And so I rented a seat in a co-working space that had just opened up and started to go there, and I very quickly met Rachel and we kind of hit it off and she talked tell everybody a little bit about what you were doing that time when we met about three or four years ago yeah absolutely so at that point I was also previous to that working either from home or grabbing some time at coffee shops here and there so I same as you was really excited to be in a co-working space and at that point in my business it was just me and working from the co-working space was such an amazing opportunity to meet other creatives such as yourself and other folks, some of who I ended up working with either as clients or hiring as contractors. And it was such an amazing collaborative space to work together and kind of bounce ideas back and forth. And you didn't call yourself Seven Layer Studio then? No, at that point, my last name was still in the name. It was Zorel Design at that point. And I know you and I had some really impactful conversations about the name. And, you know, as the years passed and I was pivoting from just being a freelancer to having a more of established business, you know, my name and it just seemed like I didn't want my name in it anymore. I wanted to make it kind of bigger than just me. Um, and you and I had some really um, important conversations around that. And I know that we talked a lot about that naming process. So what kind of clients were you working with then? And has that changed any in terms of how your agency has, has evolved over time? So what were you doing then? So at that point, I, it was very similar in the respect that I still had lots of clients in different, in different industries. So whether it was um, at that point, I was working, I believe, with a PR company and a school and a small architecture design firm. And I would say from then until now, our client base is similar. You know, some clients are, are larger now than they were then, but the breadth of services is really what has changed the most. So at that point we were just really providing, you know, straight design solutions. And now while we're still obviously providing design solutions, we're thinking strategically and kind of more big picture vision for the companies that we work with and just more robust services. So things like packaging and motion and things that we weren't doing back then. So you, um, you were working with smaller clients. Most of them, from what I remember, came to you via word of mouth and they were fairly local. You have, didn't spend a tremendous amount of time working in agencies or in-house and companies before you went freelance. So what experience did you have um, before you went out on your own? So when I was first starting out, I, you know, post-college, I spent a couple years working for companies um, as their in-house designer. Um, you know, it gave me a chance to kind of get my feet wet and to just, you know, see what it's like working out in the actual industry post-college. And, you know, at that point, I was at this sort of pivotal path in my career, and I was either going to be possibly going to graduate school or maybe, you know, getting into the grind of big New York City agencies. You know, at the time, it really didn't feel like either of those two directions were right for me. And so, 
right around that time is when I, you know, decided that it was time to kind of start my own business. I had thought originally that it was going to be something that would happen down the road. I was in my early to mid twenties. And so it seemed like I needed to spend, you know, at least another 10 years working before doing it on my own. Um, I ended up having coffee with a woman who I knew through our circle of friends who had started a PR company. And I was really angling, maybe she was going to give me a job, I was hoping. Um, and we got to talking and she had told me that she had started her company um, in PR post September 11th. And she was saying to me, it's never the right time to start a business because I had told her, oh, eventually I would love to start my own business, but I just felt you know, too inexperienced and young. And by the time I left that coffee on, on 17th Street in the city, I, I really gave notice like the next day and just kind of started. It was a real immediate you know, moment in time. And that's kind of how I got my start. Wow, total, total leap of faith. Like, that's pretty impressive. So did you have any clients when you just like put in your notice? You know, I, I not, no, not really. I, you know, I had like, I think I had like one side project. It was really not even a client at the time. It was like somebody, somebody who I knew through somebody else was starting a small business and I um, designed their, their logo and their menu for like a small deli in, um, on the east side and um no i it was sort of just a slow build it was a big risk it was kind of a leap of faith um and i'm so glad that i that i had the courage and a little bit of just the ignorance to do it <laughs> <laughs> so how did you learn the the whole business side of things i mean developing presentations and proposals and you know invoicing and tracking jobs and like the whole infrastructure of running a freelance business. How did you, how did you learn all that? So, um, you know, when I first started, I didn't even know what I didn't know. You know, it was like, okay, let me have my notebook and make a list of what I need to do today and then cross it out. So it started off, you know, like the methods and the infrastructure of it were very, very simplistic. And then it was just, you know, little by little, you know, I think always early on, I wanted to make sure that I was putting out my most professional version of myself, probably because I was, you know, 24, you know, female run business with no real background. So I think I always wanted to just, you know, elevate the professionalism of what I was doing. And so whether it was corresponding with clients or, you know, designing an invoice with, the logo on it. Um, I was just paying attention to every single one of those things. And then with time, it was as, you know, as soon as one process was working really well, it's constantly taking the time to say, well, how can we be doing it better? And we do this right now as a company all the time, because, you know, we, we always have to be adaptable to what the needs are, because the needs are always changing. So whether it was just me or having a team, it's kind of building that infrastructure to meet the everyday needs. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the transition of going from Rachel as independent single woman freelancer to team and seven layer studio. So what happened was the work building up to the point where you just personally couldn't handle it by yourself and you needed to bring someone on. What did that look like in terms of what was happening in the business and how you brought someone in? Yeah. So, um, you know, starting in 2017, right around the time that I changed the name of the business, you know, the, uh, the volume of work was just getting to be, you know, too great for, for just me to execute on it. And, you know, over the course of the, you know, bunch of years before that, um, you know, you touched on it before, you know, I started off in the city, um, you know, then I got married, my husband and I, you know, moved had a couple of babies, moved again, had another couple of babies. So all of this was happening while I was running the business. So by the time 2017 came around, um, our, our breadth of clients were was just pretty substantial in addition to, um, you know, being present for my family and being present for my clients. And so it was at that point that it was really clear that it was time to grow the agency and really build it into an agency and, and you know, make the first hire. Um, 
And so that, that was really the, the driving force. And then once, um, you know, once I had the chance to start working together as a team, it really became very clear what the potential was. You know, it's one thing doing stuff yourself, but then working and collaborating with other creatives, you're just bringing, you know, double then triple the, the ideas, the vision, um, and then the process and being able to kind of scale. So some people, when they scale, they bring in someone to handle the administrative stuff first, like the emails and the scheduling and that sort of stuff to kind of free you up to do more design and less of the drudge, right? Did you do that or did you bring in a designer to help your bandwidth in terms of design and then you managed and kind of moved up to, you know, managing director slash designer? How did that, what did that look like in terms of the skill that you brought in at first? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, all the years that I was running the business as a solopreneur, which I'm sure everybody who's listening can relate to, you're doing everything. You know, if you're a creative, you're doing both the creative, but you're also sending the emails and you're collecting payment and following up on invoicing and paying your taxes. So um, none of it, you know, managing that end of it, none of that was new. So when it was time to kind of bring on a team member, um, it was all about the creativity. So, and, and not just, you know, not just the design, but also the design thinking and, you know, the idea generation and conceptually figuring out where we wanted to go and what our brand voice was and, um, and what that looks like. And, and it was by far the right decision because together when it was just, Two of us in those days, we were able to manage all the communication and all the, you know, the emails and all of that, you know, together, but also bring, you know, double the amount of creative work, which allowed us to increase our clientele and what we're offering and just have more bandwidth. So a lot of people now in the digital age, right, they use people, you know, in the Philippines or, you know, in another country, and you chose to interview and hire someone local who you could work with in the same physical space. Why did you go that route rather than possibly going a route where you were, you know, working more virtually? Yeah. So, I mean, part of, part of what I have always found so incredibly important for the agency is the culture and the atmosphere and the ex experience of what we're doing every day. So, you know, part of it is creating work that we're all so proud of and that's meaningful and impactful for the clients that we're doing, but we like to have a good time and have fun while doing that. And part of that is, you know, working in person, you know, so now these days we're on hybrid, but, you know, working with other creatives, connecting with other creatives and building something together as a team rather than just kind of my vision solely being being brought out. So you were more comfortable just like having someone who you knew personally and who was close by that you could work with, you know, in proximity than someone virtually. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when, you know, the first hire, it wasn't, the first hire wasn't somebody who I knew personally. It was, you know, I had been interviewing and, you know, I think that when you're thinking about growing your team, there is a professional aspect that is invaluable, but there's also a personality aspect, which is, which is, you know, so invaluable. And I think that having that kind of creative dynamic, especially when you're small, is really important because, you know, one thing with larger agencies is that you do have like, you know, that creative ping pong, you know, the back and forth, which just always generates new ideas. And I think it's, it's always about the ideas at the end of the day. So I have to say to everyone listening that Rachel is, I've, you know, probably hired 400 designers in my life and interviewed 4,000, and I've seen a lot of portfolios. And Rachel Zarell is one of those designers who has an eye for quality design that is exceptional. And I think that anybody who's listening should go to sevenlayerstudio.com and check out um, Rachel's portfolio because it is absolutely beautiful. And I've always been very impressed by the work that she does for her clients and her clients being local, small to medium sized businesses, um, most local, I think you have some international clients now, but um, are more than, than um, fortunate to be working with, uh, with Rachel and her team. And so uh, when you I know that when you were hiring your first hire, you were very concerned about the aesthetic because you have such a good aesthetic and you put out such great quality design work. And so I know that you were kind of sweating bullets a little bit as you were looking at portfolios. Describe that portfolio kind of evaluation 
um, experience that you went through? Like, how did you choose and where did you look to find people? How did you go about finding someone local? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I first, you know, answering the question about the portfolios, um, you know, because I'm now at the stage where I'm constantly reviewing portfolios, whether it's to hire uh, for, you know, a new team member or just a freelancer. And, you know, there's such, I would say with the portfolios, the very first, uh, my first impression of um, a designer is really their resume. You know, I, I could look at a resume and understand so much about what the skills are before even getting to the portfolio. So I would say, first, don't underestimate the power of a resume. Type, it's all typography. Um, it's a huge opportunity that's sometimes overlooked. So that's kind of the first. So not thing. just content, but the design of your resume. Oh yeah. And it, not, not that it has to be something flashy, but you know, sometimes it's something that's understated even with, with choices of typography hierarchy. Um, and then I would say in terms of, you know, looking at portfolios, it, it's all about risk taking and, you know, it, it's very easy in a way to kind of grab a trendy typeface and just kind of type set something, but it's really the sensibility of the combination of uh, form, texture, typography, color. Uh, there's just this sensibility um, that you can just kind of pick up on, whether it's in student work and not, not to say that it's all meant to look so perfect, but it's kind of the the risk taking, you know, plus the design sensibility um, that you could just learn so much for with it, so much in it for a portfolio. And then hiring local, you know, I think for my very first hire, I just was incredibly fortunate um, to find, you know, luckily, actually, like the town that we live in, it's like a creative powerhouse. So there's so many creatives, so many talented creatives. Um, and then, you know, since then, like, you know, our employees will drive up to, you know, maybe an hour. So it's still local, but it definitely, you know, the, the needle, the needle is wider. Um, you know, there's just so many creatives, like we live 16 miles west of, of New York City. So we're fortunate to live in a place that has a lot of creatives, but there's so many amazing creatives everywhere. Yeah, it, it was funny when Rachel and I were together in this co-working space, one of the things that she told me, I think, I think you were the one who told me this. You said, um, have you joined, there's this new Facebook group, it's called Soma Amen, and it's, Soma stands for South Orange Maplewood, which are the two towns that we live in in New Jersey, and Amen sound, stands for Advertising Marketing Entertainment Network, and some guy had started a Facebook group, and she said, it's been open for about three weeks or a month, and it already has 1,500 members or something like that, or 5,000 members. It had grown, like, incredibly quickly. And so that said to both of us, man, we live in a hotbed of creative people. Like, I, I call it the spawning ground. It's like everyone who's in New York City or Brooklyn or Queens, and they have babies, and they get married and they decide to, you know, they, they don't want to buy a $1.5 million railroad in Park Slope, Brooklyn. They move out to Maplewood or South Orange and they are creative directors or animators or writers or photographers. And literally every other house out here, it seems like, is someone who's in the creative industries. And so uh, Rachel is totally right in the fact that we do. We live in a total hotbed of, of creative people. I've always found that... Um, it's very convenient, number one. I never would have met you, I don't think, if, if that wasn't the case. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's just awesome. It's an awesome place to live because our peeps are out here, you know, which is great. <laughs> um, so describe a little bit about what, what does a typical project look f like for you? Who, who is it, what kind of a business is it and what do you do for them? Mm -hmm. So um, our clients are kind of all over the map. So everything from... Uh, pet medication company where we would do something like naming, branding, packaging, um, the user experience when they receive something in the mail, um, to a floral design studio creating um, brand and custom illustrations, signage, uh, packaging, tags, vehicle design, all of that. Um, to let's say a zero waste refill shop or bakery. So we're kind of all over the map. We're in healthcare. Um, and, you know, basically what we're offering for them and working with them to do is everything from 
their um, the brand strategy end of it all the way down to the deliverables such as the you know the brand assets and the design whether it's website or packaging or even something as you know small but impactful as social media templates or even coming up with campaign ideas um, you know we we provide full service creative support and a lot of our clients will work with for long term so for many years so they might come to us in the infancy of their business and then we work and support them as they grow. So whether it's opening up multiple locations um, or just or just those companies getting to the next level and then needing creative to support that. Do you like working with companies that are just starting off like as they're just kind of starting up generating revenue? Do you like working with companies that are kind of like in that first stage of evolution where they might have designed something and now they're successful and making money and opening locations and they realize, oh, we got to like get our act together and do a much better job of our branding? Would you like with working with the like real startup startups or do you like working with the kind of slightly more mature businesses? So I would say it's a little bit of a combination. I think that one of our many, like one of our favorite clients to work with would be a client that is just starting out, but they understand the power of design and how effective it could be for their business. So, you know, some business owners have a really good understanding of why it makes a difference to invest in the brand before they launch, whereas others kind of want to get it up and running. And then, you know, in year one or two, um, put it all together. But I would say that really our favorite thing is to work work with a founder, work with a startup who has a really strong vision and an understanding of where the potential lies and then kind of building that trust with them to allow us to, to do our job and, you know, make them look fabulous and elevate you know, elevate the standards of creativity for them. How do you how do you do that initial kind of vetting of a company to whether they understand the value of design or are willing to invest in design? I mean, that's the that's the kind of um, the headwind that a lot of creative professionals um, are up against and have a hard time kind of establishing as to uh, finding clients who do understand the value of branding or are willing to invest. Where do you make that determination? And if they don't seem to value it as much as you wish they would, do you go through some sort of an education process that can bring them along to a greater understanding? Or do you walk away and say, these people aren't for me? So, I mean, we usually will only work with clients that we're really aligned with, you know, and pretty early on in a phone call or a meeting, you know, we'll tend to have a good sense. Oh, is this somebody who really wants to work with us? Is this somebody who really we feel like we can collaborate well with? Because, you know, I'm sure you could relate with it, relate to this is that if you have a client who's not trusting you with your work you can't really deliver what they're hiring you to do <laughs> um so i yeah i mean most folks most folks will come to us and they'll have some understanding you know of what brandon can do with us they they see you know they'll have a chance to take a look at our work or they're familiar with our work and they know what we've done for other businesses i would say that that's the biggest advocate for education they'll say hey we saw what you did with that company we know that the company that you guys are working with are at a certain caliber and we want our young company to look you know similar to that um yeah and then we definitely have clients who come to us and they say you know we'll, we just need a little well you know that's it and then you know we start kind of getting into the other questions and the other layers of um of what they're actually what their business is actually trying to do to make sure that you know that we're giving them what their company needs not just what they think they need for their company. So do you drop the bombshell of, you know, if you need a brand identity and a little bit of strategy and a name and a website, we are, we generally fall into this price range. Do you give them like a broad ballpark and then mm -hmm. you watch them glaze over or they start shaking or like they go, oh, I can get that on fiber. Um, do you run into that at all? And how do you handle that part of the process? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, very early on, I would say in most phone calls and meetings, you know, the the conversation will end with budget. You know, it used to be something very early on my in my career that I was nervous to talk to my clients about. Um, you know, a family member gave me advice once to just say to the client, 
tell me what your budget is. And I thought, oh my gosh, I could never ask that, you know, and over the years, um, that's exactly what the questions that you should you start, you stop wasting your own time by just getting over yourself and asking that question. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. It's, see, you know, and, and ultimately a potential client wants to know that as well. And, you know, sometimes, Sometimes those conversations can ha happen via email, sometimes on the phone, but I do like to just let clients know this is generally what our price range is, just to, just to know if you're talking apples and apples. <laughs> so how do you promote your agency? How, uh, do, you know, do you get everything through word of mouth? Do you use social media? How do you use the social platforms that you do show up on? And um, how do you go about keeping that pipeline of clients full? Yeah, um, word of mouth for sure has been the biggest driver of clients for the studio. Um, and I would say, you know, when it comes to word of mouth, it's not just about um, talking to people. Um, it's really about, about doing the best possible job you could do for the clients that you have right now, because they're, they're gonna be the ones that are talking about your company. Um, so I think that the biggest way to kind of grow and think about those things is just doing the best possible job you can with the clients that you have. Um, you know, and we're just, uh, we're, you know, we're on, we're on Instagram, we're on LinkedIn. We're not, we're not really, we try not to be on Facebook anymore. <laughs> um, you know, we spend a lot of time, I would say in social media, giving folks a peek at the work we do behind the scenes, what the culture is, what the team is. Um, and then on LinkedIn, we're sharing our work as well. And then we're also sharing um, articles and insight as creative professionals, just providing that, um, that insight into what we do and why we do it. And you also use email, right? Yeah, we have a, a monthly newsletter that we send out and that includes new work that we've done and then it also includes um, creative insights. So whether it's like tips, tricks, podcasts we're listening to, books we're reading, um, that sort of stuff. And we're just launching in December a studio um, playlist on Spotify, which we'll be sharing for folks to enjoy. Oh, that's brilliant. I love that. So why no Facebook? Well, it just seems like the the toxic nature of, of Facebook and their um, and their morals just aren't aligned with where we want to be. There's a lot of negativity, and we like to we like to um, be present in places that are a little bit more positive. So, how do you use um, if Instagram's your main platform? How do you use Instagram? How does that? How, uh, do you just publish work there, or how do you yes, engage? Sure. Mm -hmm. So we share our work regularly, and then we're also sharing just what we're thinking about, what we're doing in the studio, photos of our space, photos of our team, kind of capturing the culture of what we do. Um, and I would say that's kind of the biggest the biggest thing that we're doing on social. And that's one of the things that I've noticed about your agency that I don't, actually don't see a lot of agencies doing. And I think that it's a best practice that a lot of our listeners could probably learn from, which is that I think that your, um, your, uh, the importance of relationships, the family of your studio, the, 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 agency culture is very important to you. And you are a very, you know, human warm person. And I think that really shows through. And one of the things that you've done with your marketing that I find impressive is that you are extremely transparent in terms of who is on our team, what they are doing, what they're thinking, what's um, inspiring them. And you um, and you put that out into the world. I mean, you have pictures of your team on social media, you have and you feature them. And it's easy to get to know your studio because you you become more visibly human that way. You don't just put your work up there and take some pretty picture of your studio with no people in it. There's um there's a, a sense of the people behind the agency in the the social media work that you do, which I find very impressive. And I encourage anyone to go and follow Seven Layer Studio on Instagram because I think that you could learn something by watching what Rachel does. Um, and so, how do you um how are you going to, how, are you planning on scaling anymore? Are you happy with the kind of scale that you have right now? Or what is, what does that look like in terms of the future for you? 
Yeah, so it seems like um, I'm so happy with what we have right now to answer that question. But I also, I, I think that we're going to keep going. <laughs> you know, the infrastructure that we have built, um, we're definitely poised to scale. You know, we, we have a full client base, which we're so happy with, and we want to just keep keep doing more. We do love being a small agency because it does allow us to just have an experience where we could, um, the team can be really strong together and also have really strong communication and relationships with our clients. But, uh, I, you know, we could definitely inch up a little bit more. <laughs> um, you know, we're just, we're just all having a lot of fun doing this and we want to keep doing it. <laughs> actually, that made me think of something. And that is, we actually talked about this, I think a long time ago, which was we, as, as Rachel said, we live 15 miles from New York City, the biggest, you know, one of the biggest cities and the, the design hub of the world. And you have a flourishing agency 15 miles outside of New York City. You have chosen not to be in New York City. And if you were to scale and get, you know, really grandiose in terms of where you wanted to take this, people would ask, hey, Rachel, why don't you move Seven Layer into the city? Why don't you open up an office in Manhattan that would add this level of, you know, a completely different level of kind of presence, let's say. Why have you chosen to stay where you are in such close proximity to the largest design center in the world, but outside of it? So I think that that's actually one of our greatest strengths. You know, New York, the design agencies in New York City are outstanding. But, um, you know, there's no reason why there can't be the same level of work provided for, you know, businesses outside of New York City. You know, we do, we love and adore working with um, businesses that are maybe just, you know, starting out. They're not necessarily in the city and being able to provide those creative chops um, outside of the city is one of the things that we pride ourselves on. And we hear it from clients all the time that they love working with a local agency, or we hear it from other creatives that they love that there is a, a design agency outside of the city um, that provides the same level and standards of design that's not New York City. So it's one of the, the things that we pride ourselves on. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the challenges that you've had. What kind of, you know, what kind of difficulties or hurdles have you had to get over in the development of your agency over the last, you know, five or six years? I would say um, probably over the last five or six years is really um, honing in on who are, who are who are the best clients for us and identifying um, identifying the right fit, you know, as, as you know, and as you mentioned before, there are, you know, a lot of individual designers that can provide a service not matched to what we do in terms of breadth or scope, but, um, you know, identifying those clients that want to work with an agency as opposed to an individual freelancer to support their growing needs of the business. Um, and I think that the other the other challenge, which is undeniable, is probably finding the right balance and redefining what work life balance means, um, and just kind of settling into that. You know, we, there's so much talk in the industry right now, um, and in the world about redefining what it is to work and redefining what it is to have a job. Um, and I think even though I may not have realized that over the course of my career, I've been inherently redefining it just because of the needs and wants that I've had personally and professionally, meaning, you know, wanted to have, wanting to have a family, wanting to have a successful business, and then figuring out where those two pieces overlap. And that's one of the things about you that I've always been, and you know this, totally impressed about, right? Rachel has four beautiful, vibrant children and also a husband who's got his own business. And she has been able to grow a successful design agency with a tremendous amount of other work to do in her life besides running an agency. And so I, I'm impressed by your and, and it's very apparent to me this kind of intentional uh, establishment of a nice work-life balance. And even though I still find it amazingly impressive that you've been able to pull it off. <laughs> really, really well done. Um, 
So do you have any, you know, who do you look for, who do you look to for inspiration or do you have any mentors or, or individuals that you've kind of tried to pattern what you do after or, you know, how do you get, how do you stay inspired that way? So I would say that that's an area, you know, having gone off on my own so early on, I actually think that that was a category that for many years I felt like was missing. You know, I did not have a mentor. I did not um, have any direct insights into design agency or even business owners. And so I think in some ways at the time, I wish I had a mentor, but in, in another way, I think it was actually helpful because it kind of forced me to redefine and define myself what my path was going to be rather than saying, oh, this person's, you know, doing something similar. How did they do it? I think I just kind of figured it out as I was going without any sort of North Star of like, this is the right way. This is the wrong way. Um, so, so yeah, I just kind of figure And then I would say observing, you know, just in terms of getting to that to that level of just like, you know, being a strong designer is really just about chasing the work, you know, when you're young mm. and starting out, like who's doing what, you know, what kind of, what designs are, are winning awards? Why are, what's making them great? You know, before I had the eye or even the skills to start creating that type of work, I was just constantly taking it in you know, like taking a look at what the work is, what makes it great, understanding. I think that some of it, of course, is innate talent, but so much of it is like, you just have to learn and you just have to try and you have to take risks to, you know, push yourself to create design work that might not be great, um, but you have to at least kind of take the risks to try to do it. So the, the entrepreneurs and the business owners that are listening to this podcast, you you obviously have your finger kind of on the pulse of what small to medium sized businesses need to develop, do pay attention to in order to grow brands that are successful. So in your work with, with clients now, is there anything that you see that small to medium sized businesses should really be focusing on in terms of their branding or their marketing? Is there any, are there any trends that are important or any platforms that are important or ones that aren't important that you would, could broadly stroke and, and uh, share with our listeners? Sure. I think that, um, there's one aspect that we've been talking a lot about in the studio and with our clients that I think is so important with every company, you know, the, the, everything is so saturated right now in every single industry. There's like endless amounts of products and businesses and all of that. So I think that if a company is able to really cultivate and understand what their authentic self is as a company and understanding, you know, what their values are, what they're trying to do and really getting into the weeds of that. Um, and then figuring out how to tell that story, both, you know, verbally, creatively, I think that that is probably the most important thing that a brand can do for themselves to put their best foot forward to kind of just find what it means to be authentic to them. Cause that's yeah. going to be what that's going to be their, you know, their special, their special thing that stands out. Yeah. The special sauce. So one of the things that you do, which, um, is you, you, do promotions that are physical things. And I want you to talk a little bit about how you view that and, and some of the things that you've done to, pro to promote your agency that are not in the digital social media realm. Yeah, so um, what we like to do is every year around holiday time is we, we give ourselves a project um, as a way to kind of send something out to our clients and our studio friends, such as yourself. Um, and it's kind of an opportunity for us to think about most importantly, the concept. So, you know, what are we, what are we going to talk about this year? What are we going to design? What is it going to look like as a physical piece? And, you know, sometimes that could be something like, you know, a poster with impactful messaging, um, you know, sometimes it could be, it, there's just different, different pieces. And um, it's kind of figuring out again, going back to being authentic, you know, what we want to be talking about, you know, several years ago, we created a poster that says, have your cake and eat it too. And, you know, we talked all about that. It was about redefining the work life balance. Um, we talked about, um, 
we talked about who we are as, as people in that time and space and um, created a poster that resonated with us and ultimately resonated with our, a lot of our clients. And then they sent us you know, pictures of it hanging it up in their workspaces or their homes. And it's just an opportunity to connect with our clients through a concept and idea. And then, of course, having a, a fun time designing it. <laughs> yeah, it's always nice having no rules in terms yes. of being able to design something that you want. No one you have to pass it through except yourself, your own creative directorship. Okay, so in this part of the podcast, we're going to move into a new part of the Brand Design Masters podcast, and we're going to call it the Rapid Fire Round. And Rachel, as a good friend, has agreed to be the guinea pig of the very first inaugural Rapid Fire Round. So these are 10 questions, 10 quick questions that we're going to blow through very quickly. And then one very big, broad question at the end. Okay, question number one, what's your spirit animal? hawk a hawk morning person or night person morning beach or mountains mountains dog person or cat person dog what's your secret talent that most people don't know you can do dance what's your favorite song of all time that is an impossible question <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to have to think about that one. <laughs> okay, I'll circle back. Favorite place in the world? Right here. What's the one thing that you wish you could master? Being present at all times. Mm. Who's your hero? All of my children. Okay. Um, what's the one thing that you would tell your 20 year old self? Keep going. All right. We're circling back. I'm not letting you off the hook. Favorite song of all time. Okay. Favorite song of all time. Um, oh my gosh. I don't know, Philip. I can't, I, I can't, nothing comes to mind at the moment. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> okay. Well, this I'm going to let you off the hook because this is the first rapid fire round and we'll have to do a test with a few guests to see if there are any questions that are like completely confounding. And I have to say, Rachel, actually, as I was writing these questions down, I was like, when I got to that favorite song of all time, when I don't know, I think I would have the same kind of trouble. What's your favorite song of all time? Well, I, I and because I'm a musician, I have different songs for different purposes, right? Um, I think it would be between My Hero by the Foo Fighters or Voodoo Child by Jimi Hendrix, the live Good version. Choices. Yeah. Oh, maybe, maybe Summertime, Janis Joplin. That okay. Be song of all time, and especially all the versions of it. Okay. There we go. See, I knew you'd show up for me. <laughs> all right. So, okay. Final big question. And I did hip you to this one and it was coming. Do you have a personal mantra or a manifesto that you try to live your life by? I think that, you know, the sentiment of tomorrow is a new day is something that's always resonated with me, you know, meaning tomorrow is always a chance to start over, always a chance to bring your best self, you know, whatever stumbling blocks or anything that maybe didn't go right. It's just the opportunity and the potential in tomorrow. I, I think that that's probably something that resonates both personally and professionally. I love that. So Rachel Zorrell of Seven Layer Studio, thank you so much for speaking with us today on the Brand Design Masters podcast. So if people want to get in touch with you or with Seven Layer Studio, where is the best place to engage with you? Um, either through our website, which is sevenlayerstudio.com, a contact form, or via Instagram as well. Awesome. Well, Rachel, thanks so much for talking to us today. Thank you, Philip. This was a lot of fun. All right. We'll have to go out to lunch again soon. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. 